day five. <clears throat> of the August 2005 seven-day retreat in spring water. I didn't quite get who was waiting for whom while we were walking. That was very, very neat. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought I was way late and I looked on my atomic time piece. It's 10.45 now, have we ever started this late? And then I was asked when I wanted to start. So here we are. Sometimes people ask, why do we walk? And sometimes they ask, what is the truth? I think that was the last question, wasn't it? Of our last meeting together. And I said, let's keep that for another time. It had already gotten late. And somebody wondered whether I didn't want to answer it. Maybe that's partly true, the truth. It's too, too, <laughs> too complex. question, what is the truth? And I can always say, by the book, it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I looked in it myself, and I don't know whether it is very clear what the truth is. Um, maybe, maybe a better question would be, why do you want to know what the truth is? turning it over to you. What is the truth? Why do you want to know? And maybe interesting things come up for each one of us. Is it that we are really looking for certainty, for security? If we knew what the truth really is, then we would know where to put our energies what center to join or to disjoin. Did you think about it while I had the day off? question sort of flitted through my mind every once in a while. But many things flit through the mind. And it's a beautiful thing when the mind gets to a stage. I don't know whether you can make that kind of a statement, whether this is a general thing. But here it is happening that the mind just does not want to carry things around. It, it wants to rid itself of anything that's bothering it or that it is sort of nagging. Not that this question was particularly nagging, but it just wants to be free and empty and, and open, open to smell the grasses and hear this lovely motor running which brings us some cool <laughs> I hope you don't mind. It's, it is very welcome. Don't turn it off because uh, it is so very welcome to have some cooling. So is it because one looks for some certainty, something in these totally uncertain times? I don't know why I say this because they have always been uncertain. I don't think there ever was a time where there was certainty for human beings was there. Not in my lifetime. Was there? Is there? Is if I say something, this is the truth and this is how to get there, this is the practice or the practices 
to undertake, you will come upon the truth. You can try. It's, it's always good if, if there is a real honest-to-goodness question that is uh, nagging in the mind to pursue it. And pursuing means nothing more or less than ask it. We've talked about it before. Ask it as into a deep, dark well of not knowing. And see all the knowings that come up. Because we want to know. The, 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 the brain produces answers, knowings. But can you hold on to it? Can you accept it? Do you know that this is the truth? Or do you now want to have a proof of what the truth is? How do you find that? Who can prove it? So, it's always very beneficial, very helpful if there is a question that doesn't leave this brain, mind, keeps dancing around. So ask it, stay with it, and don't know. And don't be satisfied with superficial answers. Of course, you can say, what is superficial? It's a judgment, and you tell us not to judge. If judgments come up, look at them, listen to them, and wonder whether that substitutes for the truth. What is it? And with this finest of all listenings, so fine that the listening space gets either wider and wider and wider or smaller and smaller and smaller. Just one point, one point of listening without knowing. Has that ever happened to you? One point of listening without knowing. Maybe the question is still lingering someplace. What is it? And an answer popping up saying, no, that's not it. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't resonate. And putting it aside like the, the ancient, so we read, the ancient Indian practices of saying, neti, 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 no, no, no. This isn't it and this isn't it either. Not that, no. And see what happens, whether maybe the mind which is normally so overcrowded and ever resourceful to bring in more stuff. Maybe it begins to empty itself with this, not this, not that, not this either. What is it then? So there's the, the hum of whatever it is, listening and not knowing. We've talked about this before, I think, since day one. I wonder if you have played with it, this asking deeper and deeper, deeper meaning, not this, not that, not clinging to an answer, not knowing. And yet there is a, uh, there's some kind of a motor there or motive that wants to know and yet doesn't allow itself to know because that is not it.
is there hearing? The sounds aren't there. Are they there without needing to know, without needing to explain, without needing to recognize? Just sounds without even using that word any longer. Sounds, reverberations throughout the body. The body, what is the body? Do you know, do we know? Or is it just a word? What is it? I don't know. Sitting so quietly and with a mind and body because they, they usually work in harmony, not always. Maybe for some people they usually work in disharmony with asking a deep question, this body-mind empties itself. Is that happening? Is that happening? You might say, well, what is emptying? Well, if it is happening, then you will know. There's nothing to cling to. And fear Apprehension disappear too with the words. There is no need to fear if there are no fearful words cruising through the mind. Have you ever found that out? It's only when fearful words and memories cruise through the body mind that there is the sensation or the sensations of fear. I don't like this. What will it do to me? What has it done to me in the past? That's too much knowing. We don't need to know so much. All we need to do is listen. In this fine, one-pointed listening. One-pointed. No space taken up. Does the not knowing itself arouse fear? People have said that in meetings. It's, it's a real fearful, uncanny sensation when I don't know. Very natural, very understandable, let's put it this way, because we realize time and again that it is the known that we cling to for security that we will be safe, that we will have a safe haven, or we will know what the truth is. And we can cling to it, or to someone who preaches it, or seems to know about it. Yeah? Does that sound familiar? Maybe not. It doesn't have to. And it is, it is a marvelous thing to acquaint oneself with the unfamiliar, with the not knowing what anything is, meaning not naming, not finding anything in the files, because that's what the brain does. It goes through the files, peruses, and it doesn't find anything. There's nothing to know security. Everything is insecure. Everything is without duration. Have you found that? That nothing lasts? Everything comes and goes? We read that. It is part of the, the, the Buddhist teaching. It's forever coming and going. There's a word for it which I can't think of right now because memory too is 
of very short duration. And you can either be alarmed at it. People have told me ever since I've been doing this work, I get so scared because my memory is going. I probably have Alzheimer's. <coughs> or I probably have two. If that's what it is. I mean, it's just a word, isn't it? Do you see it right now, this instant? If that is a word, and if it is spoken by someone to whom we attribute authority, like for instance a doctor, if he says that you have Alzheimer's, it's, it's scary. Why? Because all that brings us fear, sensations of uncanniness, is what we remember. <coughs> Why? We, we wrote a little, put together a little booklet here. It's sitting out on the ever more crowded uh, reading table. I'm amazed. Yet every time I come back here, the table is growing <laughs> in height and in volume. I hope people are buying that stuff. Are you? Some of it is good, some of it not so good. There's this uh, transcription. Two people on staff thought they would make a booklet out of uh, a time in a, in a dialogue about, let me get it in my memory. I got a little left. It's not mine, though. <laughs> Nash. John Nash's movie, or movie about him. And it apparently uh, occupied a lot of people's minds. There were, were a lot of comments and feelings expressed. So we went into it. And I did mention a, a staff member who was here years ago whose father had Alzheimer's at first in the beginning stages and then in the advanced stages. And he, every time he came back from a visit, he lived far away, I asked him, how was it? And most of the time he had a pretty miserable time with his dad who was unhappy with his dwindling, disappearing memory. And then one time when he came back, he was beaming. He said, my father is well. He has forgotten that he's forgetting. <laughs> and you can understand that. If you put yourself into somebody's place, and the place of the family, when you don't think anymore that you have Alzheimer's, or you, you don't think anymore that you're deteriorating, What's going to happen to me tomorrow? All of this is memory stuff. When that sort of fades and dwindles and diminishes, then the emotions that go with these thoughts dwindle too and go away. And there's no fear about me with this, uh, what is a word for it? disability. The moment you put words to something, and some words are pretty heavy, uh, then the body produces corresponding emotions and feelings, and then we suffer from that. And then we suffer from that suffering because of, uh, oh, I can't explain it all, it's so clear, we all have that experience. Do we also have the experience that if we forget about it, don't think about it anymore, or don't remember the, the appropriate words, then where is the fear? Where is the apprehension? Where is the discomfort? Does it just hang on to the words, to the memories up here and throughout the whole body? Does it? Play with it, find out, so you're really more cognizant of what goes on in this body-mind. So you don't have to go ask a teacher or a therapist, a spiritual teacher or 
therapist. We got into something the other night there, other afternoon. Where? I don't even remember that so much anymore. Uh, at the time, it seemed upsetting, even to me. I usually don't get upset over what goes on in groups anymore, but that time, the fact that, what was the fact? What got me upset? Anybody remember? Well, storytelling. Storytelling, yes. Yeah. That... Therapy versus inquiry. Yeah. That was something very nice somebody brought up. Is this therapy here or is it inquiry? And what's the difference? That was not upsetting. That was very soothing. <laughs> Somebody had the right uh, words and the right understanding. This is not a therapy place. It is a place of inquiry. Of course, somebody can say that a million times. It may not soothe you. It may not uh, hit the spot. I found that it was very, very helpful to point out that what we're doing here is not therapy, it's inquiry, and those two are not the same. Because there was more to it, that it was felt the way I dealt with it was rough or mean. We also have to remember, maybe I'll say it right now, this retreat has an extraordinary large amount of what we call new people, people who haven't been here before and haven't experienced uh, Tony and her questioning and haven't, haven't experienced the people who are being addressed by, by me. And as I said, some people I feel very sure I can be a little rough, and the person will, will be able to take it, maybe even be jolted out of a rut. Maybe not. Maybe that rut will be there this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything. So, because um, we're all learning, wonder of wonders, we are learning about ourselves. It does happen that one begins to disidentify a little bit with this body-mind. As long as this is mine, 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 my body, my mind, that has to be protected and defended, as long as that goes on, we get hurt. It's inevitable. Can we learn that? So the next time we get maybe at least a little bit less hurt. And also come here more often to see that this is not a place where people are being attacked or misunderstood. <clears throat> Even if something rough is said. Or you may be on the other side of the fence. You may feel, my God, why doesn't she say anything? <laughs> it's about time she opened her mouth said something that has happened just the same amount as people saying, why is she so rough? And maybe just as with Krishnamurti and Nisargadatta and who else, I don't all know, as you get older and more decrepit, you get meaner. <laughs> you think that's funny? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so where was I? Was hmm? <laughs> getting meaner? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking of some other book. Oh, I read a book. As a matter of fact, it's by Joan. Um, Joan Tollefson. So it's public. I'm not divulging any secrets. 
Um, she said, looking back, and that book is already written quite a while ago, she said, looking back, why I left Springwater when I did leave it, it was because you can't laugh there. Tony doesn't like it when people laugh. <laughs> Actually, what had, I, mean, I, I want to open this up. What had happened, what this referred back to was, she gave me the a, a tape of a teacher, a, a modern teacher, and she asked me how I liked it. And I said, what I didn't like so much is that the audience was continuously laughing, a little bit like we are doing today. Continuously laughing, and so was the teacher laughing right uh, into his microphone or whatever there was to, to catch it. And I felt um, he really had something to say. He's a good teacher, good person. And I wanted to hear, and here comes this Salve, we say in German, Lachsalve, this, what, what is the English word for it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, why do I ask you about English words? Mm -hmm. um, uh, a cannonade of laughter. A cannonade of laughter. Yes. <laughs> That's what's literally translated. Maybe it, uh, it isn't quite what is going on here or there. But something that interrupts you and uh, that sort of distracts you. And maybe sometimes uh, this is done on purpose, either by the students or by the teacher to distract from one not understanding what he says or not understanding, well, whatever. I don't have to interpret it. But um, I found that was uh, distracting, this constant telling jokes and so forth. And I, and I said that to her and out of that grew this remark that she discourages laughter. Well, please, if that's what you feel, you can laugh. Although yesterday I said something, didn't I? The day before, when somebody laughed again, I said, it wasn't that funny. Did you hear that? Mm. I said that. You did. That wasn't very nice. It was a little bit mean. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, away from this. Where were we? Getting me now, but we're off of that. Saying who? Yeah, say like, who? Not this time. Just no. breathing. Just breathing. Because some people do that. It's, it's a good practice if you want to practice to to ask who's doing this or who just did that. Not that I like practices particularly or hand them out, but it can sort of bring you back. Although there's no going back. Back is not a good word. It sort of can sweep out the room and clear things up. Who is laughing or who wants to be distracted? Who wants to know the truth? Huh? lost the thread. Actually, since there are no practices, there's no thread to lose. That's the beauty of what is uh, suggested here, not given as a practice, but just suggested when people say, well, what do you do here with all your time in spring water? You don't do anything, you just, you just listen and look and are open and attend to what's there without knowing. That's marvelous, because we don't do that in our busy, loaded, everyday life. We just <coughs> jump from one occupation, one distraction to another. And yet, the world is so full, so full with 
amazement, amazing things. That are so worthwhile listening to and attending to in a new way, not in our old fangled ways of having to explain it, but what is it, what is it? I have never really noticed it. And not what is it with the customary answer, well, it's this or that, I have to look it up in the encyclopedia, but what is it can be a real opening question. Opening into what? Opening into not knowing. And therefore, attending, listening freshly, like never before. This instant of what is it? I don't know. But let me look and listen. people in the hall and somebody sitting there as though she was a teacher but she says she isn't <laughs> so maybe I'll believe it oh, believe it truth is that the truth oh, we'll put it aside you don't have to know anything here you don't know who the sixth patriarch was even though I may mention him he was a wonderful wonderful person wonderful teacher you don't have to know it, you don't have to remember it, even though you may discover in yourself the ambition to remember it and to know it. And next time when that question comes up, you'll be able to really shoot out the answer. <laughs> because that's what we've been trained to do. And if we see it, really see it come up, look at it carefully and with a little distance, and we can see how ridiculous it is. We don't have to know, we just have to see. And what do I mean by see? Has that question ar arisen for you? Here she talks about seeing it and see it. But what does she mean? Seeing it, this impulse to know, for instance. What does seeing it mean? Is it that with continued work of this moment, looking and listening and sitting quietly and not knowing, is it that the body-mind becomes more and more transparent to itself, to its impulses and its drives, its needs, its internal questions, its desires, its fears, do they become more transparent, meaning they can be noticed, you don't have to be so, what is it, I don't have to be a miracle maker, what is this, so, a magician, to a human being. It, is, it does happen. This increasing transparency to thoughts arising or an angry emotion gripping the body. Curiosity arising. The desire to look more clearly. This happens. You don't have to be a magician. Although we are, we are not into magicians, but these books, which I haven't read yet, have you? The Harry Potter. I haven't read those, but there must be something to them, but I have not had the impulse to read them. Because the magic is all around you, inside you and all around you. All you need is 
this increasing transparency, which some people find scary. I don't want, I don't want so much transparency. I don't want to see everything that goes on in me because it, it doesn't fit my image of myself. I'm not a fearful person. I'm brave. At least I want to be brave and I don't want to see fear arising. Is that, does that happen to you? Oh, I don't want to see anger arising because I'm really, I'm working for the peace movement. <laughs> and peace, people in peace movements get that anger under control. That's what I want to achieve and accomplish, which is a, a, a worthy uh, aim, but you need to see the anger arising, the non-peaceful uh, impulses. If you don't see those, you will not understand angry people. If you don't understand them, you can, cannot be with them in an intelligent way. And it'll just be a violent way, trying to get them out of that. So that's a, a marvelous byproduct, if you will, of meditation, is this growing inner light. Luminosity or it's not nothing any not anything special. It is so clear that it happens. Seeing words, expressions, curse words, angry words or peaceful words arising in this body mind. Amazing. And I had thought I was so different. Haven't we? Haven't we all thought we were different than what we are beginning to see, to glimpse when we sit here quietly or take a quiet walk? Because if we take a quiet walk through the meadows, there's so much to see we usually don't have inner transparency. It, it comes eventually, but in the beginning, it's just the wonder of a flowering meadow, its sounds and buzzes, and the fragrance of all of these flowers, and blossoms, and fruit surrounding us. I have no saliva left. And you need that for talking. Maybe this doesn't belong into a talk. So, pardon me if it, if it disturbs you. Now, if questions have arisen in the course of this talk or, or do afterwards. It's okay to write them down afterwards. Not so good to write while the talk goes on. It's disturbing to your neighbors and even to, to you too because when you write down it's very hard to listen at the same time. So write it down afterwards and bring it to the question period so that what needs to be clarified can be clarified, at least attempted to be clarified. It may not work or it may, but we all are talking about the same thing that was said. Oh, maybe it is not the same thing. We hear different things. It's also amazing. Not everyone hears the same thing is being said, but we can get into a dialogue over it. Not so much an argument, but dialogue. In this wonderful, bright, 
We will end here for today. 